Hello, and welcome to Keith Watts Online Ministries. We'd like to welcome you today uh, for the message of this week. And uh, the message, the title of the message is Part 1, The Crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Next week, it'll be Part 2, The Crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And then after that, the next week will, after that will be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. The Passover is coming up. And that's when he was put on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. At the start of the week, Mary Magdalene and those women went to anoint Jesus. And he had already come out of the grave. And that's why we celebrate uh, Sunday, the first day of the week. And so really excited about the messages, excited about the one today. And so let's go ahead and pray and get into the message. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins. And thank you for coming out of the grave after the third day. Thank you so much. And Lord, I pray that you will bless this message, the messenger, and everyone that hears it, Lord. And may it touch the hearts and lives of people. I pray that I will get out of the way so the Holy Spirit could take over and preach through me. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. The uh, text verse is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, nothing could pay for our sins. Silver, gold, material things, Nothing could pay for our sins, but one thing, and Peter talks about it in verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so today, the message, the first part of the message is going to be about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but I'm going to go at it uh, a different way. I want to look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ through the eyes of the prophets hundreds of years ago, six, seven, eight hundred years ago, several hundred years ago. They prophesied everything that happened to Jesus. And also in the book of Psalms, they sang about it. And so the messages today and next week and actually the next week is all, all going to be about looking at it through the eyes of the Old Testament prophets, and I pray that it'll be a blessing to you and will touch your heart. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and get into the first point. I have eight points, and next week I'm going to have eight, uh, eight more points. And so that's why the introduction is a lot lo smaller than normal. So, but we're going to go ahead and get into the first point. The first point is that they were, uh, he was betrayed by a friend. And so in Psalms chapter 41, verse 9, Psalms chapter 41, verse 9, Yea, mine own familiar friend is whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. And then the prophecy was fulfilled in Luke chapter 22, verse 47 and 48. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. 
But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas not only betrayed Jesus, Jesus loved Judas with all of his heart. He was a condemned man for uh, portraying innocent blood, the innocent one, Jesus Christ. But Jesus loved him. He was part of the twelve. He spent three, three and a half years with Jesus, really close, part of the inner circle of Jesus. And Judas is a carrot betrayed Jesus for money. Money is the root of all, the love of money is the root of all evil. And Judas is a carrot loved money more than Jesus. And he was not betrayed by an enemy. You would think an enemy would betray him. But no, this was one of the closest friends that Jesus had. The twelve were closer in relationship to Jesus than any other person. And Judas is a carrot because of the love of money more than the love of Jesus betrayed him. He wanted more and more money. And so he betrayed him with a kiss. And I want to ask you this question. Did Judas Iscariot show affection towards Jesus with this kiss? No, he didn't mean it. He, he kissed Jesus to show on the outside the affection that was supposed to be on his heart. And oh, how many times as Christians we do that? How many times does the world do that? They preach Jesus, they say the name of Jesus, uh, they do all these wonderful works on the outside, but on the inside they're raving wolves. On the inside, the born again Christian is is cold hearted and and lukewarm and a carnal Christian. And so. That's the way Judas Iscariot was. On the outside, he showed that he really had love and affection for Jesus, but on the inside, he didn't. And so Jesus, it was predicted in the book of Psalms, a song, that he would be betrayed by a friend. And he was, in Luke, betrayed by a friend, Judas Iscariot. And then the second point, is uh, that he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. In Zechariah 11, 12, probably around 487 BC, when Zechariah had written this prophecy about Jesus, he said, and I said unto them, this is Judas Iscariot talking to the priest in the, in the court there, and I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they wait for him, prayed for my price, 30 pieces of silver. They weighed for his price, the 30 pieces of silver. And 30 pieces of silver was not a whole lot of money. I was checking into it. And at the time, uh, the Bible that I'm studying, it was worth $52.80. Back then, it probably wasn't even worth that. Because that was the market of silver when they had written this book. And today, it's even higher. And so he was sold for under $52.80. And 80 cents. And my question is, is how much is a person worth? I've heard here in America, a person killing a person for $100 or $50 or not all that much money. Just to, just to have $100. And, and so ungodly and so evil. But I, I, want, I got uh, two more questions to ask on this point. How much is a person worth to Jesus? That's a, a good question. How much 
is a person worth to Jesus? Well, when Jesus was uh, uh, given the parable of uh, the rich man, he said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He compared a man's soul to the whole world. And I believe in the heart of Jesus and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, I believe one person is worth far more to the Lord than the whole world put together. All the money, all the material, all the houses, all the businesses, all the land, the whole world for Keith Watts is worth more to Jesus than the whole world. And Judas of Cariot sold Jesus for under $52.80. And that brings me to my third question, my next question. It is, how much is Jesus worth? How much? Is Jesus worth? If we are worth, one person is worth more than the whole world. The Jesus has to be worth far more than that. And the price of Jesus, how much he is worth, is priceless. I've heard the statement, when God sent his son on the earth to die on the cross, he robbed heaven of her treasures. Jesus is far worth more than $52.80. But, oh, Christian, we live our lives like we he's worth $52.80. Oh, we live our lives like it's $52.80. We need to live our life for him like he's priceless. We need to live our life for him and go all out for him because we love him. Because he is priceless. You cannot measure the worth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. No one can. He is worth more than the world. He is worth more than the universe. He is worth more than heaven. He is worth more than the angels. Oh, he is worth far more than $52.80. We need to start living. For him, like he's priceless. We need to start living for Jesus, like he's priceless, because he is. He died on the cross for our sins. And then the third point he was accused by false witnesses. In the law of Moses, it took two witnesses to establish the law, to establish the person they were witnessing against. If there were two witnesses and they committed a, a sin unto death, they were put to death. If one witness came forward and witnessed that he did what he did, he was not put to death. And and when you find and see what all happened, the priest in the court, they they broke all these laws. They broke all of them. Broke all the laws. And so he was accused by false witnesses. In Psalms 35, 11, false witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. And then it was fulfilled in Mark. Chapter 14, verse 57. I can't read. I still got tears in my eyes. Mark 14, verse 57. And there arose certain and bare false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made without hands. 
the false witnesses came forward, and there were so many of them, and they could never agree to each other. Not even two witnesses came together. And Jesus, when he said this, was talking about his body, his temple. And then the glorified body was not made by hands, <laughs> uh, by him, his glorified body. And it wasn't even talking about the temple that they were in. And so they were, they were accusing him. And the question, I mean, not the question, but the statement is uh, that the devil is the father of all lies. And he still is today. Every lie that's ever been spoken in mankind's history, past, present, future, all comes from Satan. He's the father of all lies. And then the third one point is on this, is that Pontius Pilate examined Jesus so many times. Remember what I said in Peter, 1 Peter 1, 19, had read the verse, he had to be without spot and blemish. And, and when the animals went forward, they had to, the priest had to examine the lamb. And if there was I mean, just one slither of spot, it was rejected, and it could not be sacrificed. And Pontius Pilate kept saying, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. Why? Because he's the spotless lamb of God. And now it, he has been examined, and he has passed the examination, and he is able to be sacrificed for your sins and for my sins. And so we're going to come to point four. In the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The next one is silent to the accusations. He, he was silent, just like a lamb. Here comes a lamb and doesn't say anything. And they're fixing to slaughter him. And the lamb is just standing there, not bad, not saying anything, not doing anything. It was the same with the lamb of God. Jesus is so amazing here. He did not speak a word. He could have. All he had to do was speak. And and his same word, his same mouth created the universe. Oh yeah, he was in body form, but he still spoke this world into being. When he comes coming down from heaven on his white horse, it says in Revelation that a sword came out of his mouth. He speaks and destroys the Antichrist and the false prophet. He speaks and destroys all the armies there to destroy him. He speaks with his mouth, and here before pollen, he is totally silent. Totally silent. Why? He's the Lamb of God being examined to be put on the cross to be the sacrificial lamb for us. And then number five, he was sped upon and smitten. I'm going so fast, I didn't read the first one, silent accusation. I got so excited. Let me go ahead and read it. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not, openeth not his mouth. That was fulfilled in Mark 15, 4 and 5. And Pilate asked him again, saying, 
answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing. So that Pilate marveled. Molot was astonished and amazed and marveled at the silence of Jesus to all of his false accusers. And he was silent. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, this was probably written about around 690, 700 B.C. Several hundred years before Jesus, it took place. And the next one in Isaiah 50, verse 6, was is the fifth point. He was sped upon and smitten, beaten. Jesus was the cat of nine tails, minus 40, minus the one. And this right here, this act right here could kill so many because it just, it was glass and rocks and all kinds of stuff, briar and all kinds of stuff at the end of the cat of nine tails, nine strings coming out, probably leather. And they got them in there and they would, oh, I can't imagine. I, I can't imagine that. And Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to smitten and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. In Matthew 26, verse 67, then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. When I was reading that earlier, going over it, it just hit me. Jesus created the hands that slept him. Jesus created the saliva that they spit upon his face. Oh, I'm telling you. It, it has been known that when you get time, read Mark 15, 15 through 19. It gives more of a description of what happened. But I, and, and I, last Sunday morning, last Sunday afternoon in Sunday school class, uh, we were talking about this. And one of the men, Brother George, said that 400 men was in that company of men, of soldiers. 400. And I just, I can't imagine what was taking place with Jesus. And I believe they were behind closed doors. And I believe that so much more happened to Jesus in that room with all of them soldiers. I truly believe it. It doesn't say that much in the Bible. But I truly believe it. I got this question. How long did this go on? How long did it all go on? How long? And I was thinking earlier as I was going over this message, every time a man came up and slapped his face, it was because of Keith Watts' sins. Every time a man came up and spit upon Jesus' face, it was because of Keith Watts' sins. Every time a man came up and plucked the beard out of Jesus' face, it was because of Keith Watts' sins. Oh, we are guilty. And he did it all for us. Every time they did it, one, two, three, on his back, beating his back, turning him up because of Keith Watts' sins. It is said that, that he looked like a piece of meat. He didn't even look like a human being. They stripped him naked and humiliated him. Why? For our sins. Oh, I tell you. We ought to go all out for him. We ought to determine in our heart. We ought to determine in our heart. We're going to go all out for you, Savior. If you love us that much, I want to love you. Oh, we need to we need to really, really get revived. We really need to get going and go all out for Jesus. Oh, I wonder. 
I wonder how long this was. It doesn't matter. Five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. It was way too long. And they did way too much. He didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. Why? Because he's the Lamb of God. Oh, Jesus. Why in the world did you pick this way? You could have picked any other way. The wrath of God came upon him to satisfy the Father for payment of sins. And it was complete. It was complete. Point number six. He was hated without reason. In Psalms 35, 19. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Whether let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. John 15, 24 and 25. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. It just hit me. If you hate Jesus, you hate the Father. If you despise Jesus, you despise the Father. You despise God Almighty, the one you think you're praying to, the one you think you're living for, the one that you think you're going all out for, for whatever God your God is. But if you hate Jesus Christ, you hate God the Father, the, the God of Abraham and God of Isaac, Jacob. You hate him if you hate Jesus. Jesus has been and is the most hated man that ever has been on the face of the earth, past, present, and future. Why? Because of his existence and what he did. Everyone knows their sin, they're going to have to pay for it. And they would rather live in sin than to bow on their knees with Jesus. But I am so thankful that the word of God says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Adolf Hitler will bow his head and bow his knees to Jesus. Joseph Stalin will bow his head and bow his knees to Jesus Christ. Why? He deserves it, and he is the God's, God's only begotten son. He deserves it. And then point number seven, the sacrifice. Point number seven, the sacrifice. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Because of all what all he went through, the peace is on us. Peace that passes all understanding from the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. It was fulfilled in Romans 5, 6, and 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. But God commended his love toward us, 
in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, I tell you, Christ died for us. The sacrificial lamb of God was slain for your sins and for mine. And now, Keith Watts, when I was 10 years old at Community Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas, received Jesus Christ as my Savior. Mary Nims, my Sunday school teacher, showed me how from the Bible to be saved. I got down on my little bitty 10-year-old knees and asked Jesus into my heart and saved me. My life has never been the same. My destination was headed to hell, and Jesus that day started building a home in heaven for Keith Watts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What is the payment for our sins? His precious blood. And nothing else. Nothing added and nothing taken away. And then point number eight, crucified with male factors, crucified with the criminals. And it was a criminal act what they did to him on the cross. It was for criminals, the worst kind. In Isaiah 53, 12, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide that spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, the criminals, the sinners, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. In Mark, it was fulfilled, Mark 15, 27, and 28. And with him, they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith he was numbered among the transgressors. He was treated like a criminal. The two thieves were guilty. They deserved what they got on the cross. Our precious Savior didn't deserve what he got on the cross. He was innocent. He was not a criminal. He's the Son of God. And this morning, as I was going over this message, actually the last couple of days, I've been thinking about this last point. The two men had the same opportunity to get saved at the same time, one on the right hand of Jesus, the other on the left hand of Jesus. They were under the same circumstance. They were both criminals. They saw what was going on, and it was pretty obvious to everybody around there, including the centurion soldier, truly, this was the Son of God. And they knew it. One of them rejected him. But he lost, went straight to hell. The other one accepted him, and he went straight to paradise. Jesus told him when he acknowledged Jesus as his Savior, Jesus told him, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise, which was next to hell. Uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And also the Bible said that the saints rose up, the saints went up to heaven. It also says in the word of God that paradise was moved from there to heaven. Also, the word of God says that hell expanded and made larger. Why? Because of all the souls that were going to be there and are going to be there. 
And it's that way for every person on the face of the earth. You are either going to choose Jesus Christ and go to heaven, or you going to either reject Jesus Christ and go into hell and eventually into the lake of fire, which is the second death. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I pray that you will do so before it's eternally too late. And I pray that you will come to the point where you realize you're a sinner and receive Christ. I ask you to get on my YouTube channel, watch what can wash away a sin, wash away your sins. Uh, another message, good, good people need a savior too. Another one, has anyone ever taken you down the Romans road? Watch these messages and at the end, receive Christ as, a, as your savior. Especially what can wash your sins away. And I'm going to uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that if there's anyone lost, they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will save millions of souls across America and millions of souls around the world. Oh, Lord, I pray before the rapture of the church, Pastor Rakundo in Burundi uh, baptized 11 souls that got saved last Sunday. Pastor Faisal in South Africa, that, that it seems like the ministry, the church is catching on fire for you. And oh Lord, I know it's happening all over the place. And I pray that it will spread all over the world. Oh, I pray that Jesus, we agree upon this prayer. And you say in Matthew 18, 19, it shall be done for them. And I believe your word. I believe what you say. And Lord, I just pray that you'll bless the rest of today and bless tomorrow's services of all over the world for Sunday. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Get a hold of me. You need prayer requests to be dealt with. My own church, Newton Baptist Church, our pastor, Tony Howarth in Covington, Georgia. We love you. You have a good day. Bye-bye.